Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Where Does Assemble, the special uh, episode we're going to do. Um, so you've seen it from the title. What the heck is that thing, and does my bike need it? So, Mike, can you turn the music down? I cannot even hear you. Oh, I uh, thought I actually stopped it. I, there we go. Yeah, I can't hear it at all. I turned it totally off. <laughs> <laughs> it was like so loud. I'm like, really? I think he's talking. Hi. Okay. Hey, we'll start again. Welcome to Riddos Assemble. <laughs> Tonight's episode, we're going to talk about the things that you may or may not need for your bike. And uh, we, we have each piled a list. We, we may have more people coming in, but we've compiled a list of things that uh, need to have, might be cool to have, probably serves no purpose, but just looks cool. And so we have a grading scale, and uh, Juice has came up with a grading scale, and Yankee has kind of helped him with that. But So what's our grading scale for all the things we're going to look at tonight? I believe um, the original intent, I wanted to do a review of like anything motorcycle related, but I like what you've done. I like what you've done with the place, but the grading scale I was going to do was like, uh, or I'm sorry, I think Yankee made it better. It was like, hell yeah, brother, or had a layer down. Had or a got layer down. down. Yeah, got a layer so down. I, I, um, <laughs> we're going to try to, you know, bucket certain items into hell yeah, and that's got to be like your initial reaction or... Eh, got a layer down. All right, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with this tonight. Um, we can get uh, we can get a couple more people in the chat. We we've, we've got some space. Um, let's go ahead and start. Let's see who we've got in the chat tonight. Wow, people have been waiting for a long time. So Joey Stromboli, uh, Sick Bastard, G Ma Rides, our our G Ma, a Dad a Pillion Style, Chasing Ghost as a Wind. Well, always good to see you come in. Serenity Kitties came in. Hello, you. Journey of Jerry's in. Uh, Journey of Jerry, I, I, he asked me about this last time. I didn't get to answer. I, I wanted to sing the song, but I did not think I could do it the justice, doing Long-Haired Son of a Center. I didn't think I could do it justice. And if I'm going to mess it up, I'd rather have Jerry there to mess it up live. So um, I'll do it with you at the next camp out if you'll do it with me. But I just, I just didn't feel right doing it without you there. So I agree with that. We need yeah. our Jerry there. Jerry's got to be there. It, yeah, it just does no justice. Um, Buck Brown, Nine Wheels on Two Wheels, Nar, our brother, little brother, nothing at random is in, and Rolling with T-Bone, and Adventures of Key Pop. So welcome, everybody. All right, so if you guys um, have any ideas, throw them in the comments, things we're going to start with. Uh, so I've compiled a small list. Juice has a list. So Juice, you want to go first? Tell us what you got. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a fancy infographics, but I was thinking of like, what are popular mods that people do to bikes that maybe they're so popular it's annoying, um, or maybe they're just unique things that they fit a certain style. So the first one that I thought of that that came to mind was fishtail exhaust. Um, I know that like that fits a certain vibe. I think it's a big, big 10 for hell yeah, brother. But I don't know. I guess I'm curious what, what the audience thinks about fishtails. So we'll see what they got. So I'll go first with that. You, you've obviously gave it a hell yeah, brother. Cause you know, you are a road King, um, aficionado yeah, yeah. and they look good say, on road it, Kings. They do look really good on a road King, but I, I don't know, man, I've never, um, and I guess it does make a difference whether it's it's, uh, it's a twin exhaust to one side or twin exhaust to two sides. So twin exhaust to two side, it, it looks even, it looks kind of cool, it looks kind of conforming, you know, and I like conformity, I'm an old military guy, but when you put both of them to one side, it just looks weird. Yeah, um, I wouldn't do a single-sided fishtail. I think it's got to be a two and a two. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to have it coming up both sides. Even when you do have a, a you know, a, a the, uh, the two and the two, and they both come up one side. It just kind of looks weird. But um, for for anything that I ride, I'd say had to lay her down. Just being devil's advocate. Sometimes it just doesn't no, ride on a bike. That's fair. I think it definitely, like, it has to be. Well, then that kind of, that's my point, though. Like, 
fishtail is like that fits a vibe but yeah you see them on choppers occasionally like um and they'll do maybe slightly different like devil pair tail variants that are like maybe upswept but it's the same general concept you know like what kind of bike you think of in your head when you hear yep. fishtail exhaust so i think it's big 10 for hell yeah. and again it's Jerry a personal said, choice i'm sorry know? Right. Fish tails for the fail is what Jerry says. So he's a, he says had a layer down on that one. Yeah. Again, it's you know it's it, it, we're not making fun of anything anybody has. This is just us personally, you know. And I've seen people say hell no, hell no, hell no, and then when they see it in person, they're like, okay, that kind of works, you know. But so we will just go with yeah. Nar says not a fish tail kind of guy. Totally, totally understandable. So chasing... I, will, I will be on the contrary. I will say there. I'm not afraid to make make somebody upset at their choices. I think we've got to be decisive tonight. We got to make decisions. Yeah. We got to have throw out our opinions because otherwise we're not. We got to have fun with it. You know, if we're not having fun, then what's the point? Exactly. Jason Go says if you have an old school chopper like a '61 stretched and a ricked out real far fishtails on one side works. It's the only place they work. <laughs> True story. All right. On to our next thing. I do have a little uh, infographic set up, so let me see if I can share my screen here. Someone else is currently sharing. Who is sharing? No one's sharing. You're sharing. Where am I sharing? I don't see it. You're it says, sharing your media board. That's why I can't share. Uh, I didn't think about that. Let me... Oh, Riverside fun stuff. Yep. Yeah, hang okay. in there, folks. We're, uh, we're getting there. All right, so let's see if I can fix this somehow. What I may have to do is do this. Let's see if that shows. This may work for us. Let's see if it pops up. Hey, there's the Mad Yankee. It's so such a delay. Welcome in, into the chat. Oh, that's how but, I do these uh, things. Okay, I think I figured this right. out. Yeah, nine mils. I am coming through a little free. I think it's the way um, we're running through Riverside because on my end, I look pretty clear, but it's just the yeah, way it is, look, man. Yeah, you look, you look good coming in and out. Okay, so uh, since I am sharing to Google Chrome, I can't share my other screen. So we'll just talk about it. So what I had, what the heck is that? What I had was a uh, the Crater Fairing. Which uh, again, the crater fairing is is the exact same thing as a uh, early thing. you on the wall. Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. Which way do I have to dive? A live, a live demonstration. It's a crater fairing. So this is actually one that uh, speaking of, I had to layer down. Which way do we go? So it's the exact same thing as a burly fairing, um, except it's about two hundred dollars cheaper. The burly goes about three hundred to three fifty. This one goes. It, it's, our, it's a mirror image on, on the screen, so I got to. But yeah, so this one goes down to uh, $99. And if you look good, this is the one that actually that I took off the, another Harley that got knocked over in the garage. I've got all my really cool uh, stickers on here. My GMA ride sticker, as she was saying earlier. Haney Moto. A lot, a lot of people we met this camp out. Um, so very cool. I'm most proud of that one, the ride factory one, because I had to go get it. Jeweler sticker. So. Yep. Yeah, so I love that fairing. Um, it fit for me. And again, again, it was a personal choice. I had to, I had to make it for me. And I love that thing. So there it is. Mad Yankee. That's a, that's a big hell yeah. Sorry, yes. Mad Yankee. Hello. Welcome to the chat. Hello. Yeah. Sorry if I seem a bit uh, spacey. I'm not actually entirely done setting up the battle station here. So I'm just trying to, get some, trying to get some things up and running. Have you been shoveling all day? I know you had uh, you shared your your weather screen with me this morning on Discord. Was it eighty inches of snow you were supposed to get? So not quite. Um, so I chickened out actually. I am not at my uh, normal abode. I fled south to take shelter here in Massachusetts with my parents. That way, the idea of that being that if I do have to end up driving into work tomorrow, it will be much less hazardous because I'll be coming from the south. So that was the. That was the theory, anyway. We will see if that actually ends up working. But no, it's just so where I'm actually at right now, it's just pouring rain. But uh, yes, back in at the actual HQ, they're going to get at least a foot of snow. 
uh, the official median prediction, quote unquote, was like 12 to 16 inches. And then there is a small possibility they could get as much as 22. Wow. That's a, that's a lot of snow for April. It is April 3rd, and it's going to snow literally all day up there tomorrow, partially into Friday as well. And, yeah, so it'll be April 5th when all of this is said and done, and there will be, like, two feet of snow. So April I, snow showers bring dead May flowers. It's, yeah. I mean, our flowers don't normally start coming until way later in May, so this I don't think is going to actually affect them at all. Because the other fun thing is that it's going to be 50 degrees next week, so this is all going to melt. Which is great, except the problem with that is that the ground was already well and truly saturated before this started. So I, d I don't know exactly what's going to happen now, but it I'm guessing. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, because when we just, it never really stopped raining up there last year. So we had a, like a bunch of floods. Like, you know, the big news was like all out of Vermont. You know, they had, it was like catastrophic out there, but it wasn't really great in New Hampshire either. We had some pretty bad floods and still just coming down on us. So yeah, this is, uh, this is going to get interesting. It's going to be a good mud season. So that's your sore thing. Actually, I, this is a great segue because I just thought of another item and it's an apparel item. And it's a very specific apparel item. So okay. do we get a big hell yeah or had a layer down for the generic neon yellow rain suit? You know the one. You've seen people ride with it. They're probably on like a gold wing or some bigger touring bike. Sport touring for sure. I own one. They're great. What do we think? So uh, I it, it, let me give you two perspectives of this. When I was a younger man and I didn't like gaudy things, I wanted to be cool. I would have said, hell no, I had to layer down. However, now that I've been doing all this riding in uh, bad weather on the bike, pretty much religiously only, it's it's a hell yeah. Because one, it's going to keep you dry. Two, there's nutty ass drivers out there and we all know them. And if you're in a bright yellow or a bright orange suit, they're more likely to see you than they are squinting in the rain, you know, and a black suit, you know, all black leather. So at this point in my life, that would be a hell yeah. Well, so I will say for the rain protection aspect, that gets a hell yeah, definitely. For the visibility aspect, I'm going to have to layer down. Um, if you happen to like neon green, that is actually fine. Not actually what I'm getting at. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a quick uh, hot take, actually. So, I believe, it is, my, it is just my own thought. Loud pipes do not save lives, and neither does high-vis gear. Uh, I would agree with that. I would actually for the same reason. agree with that. Yep. I get, I, I think the intention of that is perfectly valid. I don't think you're doing anything wrong wearing that. And I'm not going to say it never helps or has never saved anyone ever. Of course, you could probably find an instance where it has. But my thing is that the reason we're often not seen by, you know, car drivers, and to be honest, other bikers sometimes too, not going to lie. <laughs> but the reason we are not seen is because those drivers are not looking in the first place. And making yourself more visible makes sense, but I don't really think it's it really helps all that much in those cases with the long run. Really, my thought has always been that no matter what you do, you are completely invisible to those drivers and you gotta act accordingly. You gotta keep safe distances. You gotta be aware as much as possible. You gotta not outrun your own visibility. So whether that's riding at night, and you don't want to out on your headlight or not go, you know, I think, um, I don't know if it was on our Discord or our sister one that they were talking about the dangers of like coming over blind hills, right? Where you can't see what's on the other side. You gotta, you gotta keep all that in mind. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong by wearing high vis gear, but I don't, I just don't think it's especially productive personally. I would disagree yeah. on the point. So having two bikes that have both have driving lights on them and the BMW that you can see from a good two miles away with all the lights on it, visibility is very important. And the more visible you can make yourself, the less problems you'll have. Especially when you're talking about things like, like a lot of blind, not blind driveways, but driveways that are blocked by trees or that are blocked by bushes. The more things you can have from the front of that bike to the back of that bike that is, is highly visible could definitely increase your visibility and sometimes you know 
and granted, people that aren't looking aren't going to see, but the people that look like, and I'm going to take phone people into um, to account for this. The people that are reading their phone or reading their messages and they're looking up every you know five seconds just to see, the more visible, the more brighter you can make yourself, they're going to see you quicker than looking up. Because I've had people tell me on the BMW, they can see me two miles away. If they're following me down the road and they're gaining on me and I'm sitting somewhere, they can see me from so far away because there's so many lights on it. And the more visible, you know, and the, the reflective gear is like lights. So anything you make, if you can make yourself 5% more visible, I'll take it. That's true. And I think there is a, something to be said about um, contrast too. So whatever color you're wearing compared to the background environment that you're in it matters a lot more. So I would agree. I, I think highlighter yellow, it, it might help a little bit. Um, but ultimately if you're in like a, it's an overcast day, you're actually better off wearing all black is my understanding on it. Um, I, so I didn't give my per personal opinion on it other to say I own one of those highlight highlighter yellow, uh, full rain suits, but it's a, it's a necessary evil. I think I have to put it in the header layer down category. It's not a hell yeah, brother, but it's a, um, it keeps you dry and potentially maybe a little safer. So. Maybe there's a middle category we need. I will give um, Rainy a point for the lights thing. I think that lights are a little bit more than, say, high vis gear, simply because, well, I mean, for one thing, the contrast, you know, if you're talking dark environment, but bright lights, that's a whole, yeah, similar theme, but a whole different ballpark at that point. But I think lights also have a sort of projection effect. Like, cause he, I mean, you can see this with cars and motorcycles, but if you're driving down the road, you can see like say after a curve it lighting up as a vehicle approaches that that's a heck of a projection effect and yeah i will totally give you that one i'm just thinking like for high vis gear the amount of visibility it realistically adds versus what the real problem is i'm just like like i said you're not doing anything wrong but yeah i just don't i don't think it's going to do you too many favors but that's just my personal opinion i have, I have absolutely no science oh my god what the hell? Here. What's up, Nar? <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to... Not much. I made myself available just for you three. Oh, we appreciate it. I'm going to try to share this screen one more time. Sure if it do. doesn't work, I'm going to give up. And it does not, so screw it. Okay, you can see I tried. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, for some reason now my share screen's not sharing, and I'm not sure why... So we'll give up. Okay. Back to the drawing board. So I had this thing that was called, let me get, so since, since I'm not sharing my screen, I can go to my screen and look at it. It's called a Thunderbox. And if you've never heard of this thing, it is a switching uh, mechanism for your bike that instead of having to have a terminals for all of your 12 volt things you're putting onto the battery, you just hook this box up to the battery, positive and negative, and you can put all your terminals into it. And what that does, it turns on when your battery voltage gets above 13.5. When your battery goes below 13.5, it shuts everything off. So what that does, when you're, when you're running off your battery, it shuts it off. When you're running off the alternator, it turns everything on. So even small things that are always hooked up but you have quote unquote turned off, like fog lights. Fog lights have three leads, especially like the ones that have the ring lights, they're always on because, it, it, and, 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 you know, you do have your on-off 12-volt ones, but the ones that have, like, three stages, like flashing, high, dim, and low, those are always powered. So they slowly trickle charge, or they slowly trickle drain your battery down. Same thing with things like the navigation. Navigation is always charging that battery on it. So, like, your your um, your TomTom -tom or your Garmin and stuff is always charging. So it's always pulling a, a charge off that battery which is fine if you're gonna park it up for a week. But when you're, when you're parking it up you know, overnight or then your battery, your, your plugs get wet or something and they start slowly just trickling off all your charge, that's what will kill your battery. I mean, if you're ever gonna start your battery and all of a sudden it's dead after like two days or wait, two days it's just dead. Well, that's what's causing it. So I think that Thunderbox is a fantastic thing. I'm actually gonna get one for both bikes because the Harley, I finally figured out it was those ring lights, the driving lights that was draining my battery down. And now I feel stupid for doing it, but no, I know. So I think we have a, we've probably got a third category here called practical. 
practical. Because I don't know what else, to, what else to bucket it this in. It's not like a hell yeah item, and it's not a head layer down item. It's something I think it makes sense to have. I, I dig it. Practical from my perspective. Practical. Yeah. It's just a, you know, it's something that could potentially upgrade the bike. Um, not, you know, a life or death thing, but if you have it and you can get it installed, it's nice to have. So, yeah, it's not a, not not really a, you know, live or take or live or kill sort of thing. But, hey, it works. If it works, then, yeah, why not? Yeah, Tony Muggins says not speeding saves lives. Uh, the funniest thing I've heard was, uh, you know, if loud pipes will save lives, just imagine what good proper training will do. Um, right. And it's 100%. I, and, I, and I have heard the loud pipes bikes. Here's the problem with those. When they come up on you slowly, it's just a slow drum, like, ride. It's not like a very loud thing that pops up. And, you know, and, and they sing a no. They're like, oh, there goes a the motorcycle. It's, it's too slow of a, of a transition. I think I'm flying by you at 100 miles an hour. Even if they didn't have pipes, you'd know it because all of a sudden they're just passing you. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not one to believe that a lot of pipes save lives. I think they just make you go deaf slowly. And uh, anybody that has a cardo, then Harley that always says their cardo is not loud enough or their or their uh, whatever they have is not loud enough, it's usually because their pipes are so loud they can't hear it. So it's not going to yeah. save you. That's me. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Practical. Yes. Um, save your life? Probably not. Yeah. No, I definitely, I'm in the category, like, I like, you know, loud pipes. I'll, oh, I'm not necessarily looking for more sound, just, like, better exhaust notes. But don't get me wrong, I like them. I think they're cool. They have a time and place. But, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pretend I would like them for any other reason. That's, no, that's the way I look at it. But, I, you know, I know some people might not like to hear this, but I actually think the loud pipes save live things is, um, more of a contrivance than a reality. So, yeah. But I'm, but I'm with you. I want I want the loud pipes as much as you do. I'm just gonna freely admit the reason is just because I think they sound cool and for nothing else. Oh, forever yeah. insert so that's why two I, to one. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I I mean I think the hell yeah brother category the loud pipes is all yeah. that goes right there. I mean definitely. I don't think this is practical cool at all. This is very much hell yeah. The, the pipes themselves are a hell yeah, but your contrived reasoning is definitely a layer down. I don't think that... I'm, I just like it. I don't think it's because right. it saves lives, though. And it's a personal right. choice, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't lie about it, yeah. Don't say you like sex because God's, God's word is to populate the earth. <laughs> just <laughs> tell me the truth. Yeah. For, and frankly, I'm already deaf, so it's not like I'm going to lose anything. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> All right, Nara, what you got for us? What you, what's your piece of? Uh, hold on, before you tell us, you can't say Advan Black. I'm, he doesn't need the Advan Black. He's already got the ST. Are you talking about like something absolutely? I think all bikes need. No, something that you think would maybe serve a good purpose. It could be for. Uh, it, it could be. Because it's aesthetic. I just said aesthetic. It could be because it's aesthetic. It could be because it helps the bike perform better. It could be because it's a good thing to have in your garage or on the bike. Or because it's controversial. Or because it's controversial and you're trying to get attention. I'll, I'll say this for me because it's the first thing I, I did to the Rebel when I had it and the Lowrider when I got it. And that is either crash bars or engine guards, whichever you choose to go with. I prefer crash guards. That way I can mount something to use as a highway bay. Because, yes, I'm short. Yes, I've been on a lot of bikes. But I still get cramped up sitting in the exact same position for more than two hours. So even though I like the controls on the lowrider, and I was actually relatively comfortable on the Rebel, once that, like, two-ish hour mark hit, I would love to stretch my legs out. So, I know that's definitely going to be more of a thing for cruisers than other styles of bikes. So, with other styles of bikes, that's where I would go more with the engine guards, like on an ADV bike. Because I was educated by uh, Tony, the sales rep at Toronto There's a difference. Crash guards are just the bars that, like, go out near the bottom of your bike. Engine guards typically more wrap around the engine itself and encase it. I didn't know the difference. Porque los dos. 
Yeah, I mean, but I, I have both on mine, so it's okay. yeah. Yeah, it's got the both. Well, one of them does. It's very practical. Yeah, yeah. so it's it's it can it can be both. It could be practical. It could be cool, and it could be very practical. That's why it's a it's a per what do they call it portmanteau, practical. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming from someone who likes to ride on ice, I think they are an, an absolutely hell yeah. Um, because uh, again, after reviewing this footage so many times, I literally bounced myself and the bike off the pavement. I I, yes. I did bounce. I hit the pavement and bounced back up almost on my feet. Um, but the bike, the only damage to it was the right uh, engine guard or the crash guard, whatever you want to call it. And in the spotlight. Now, if I would have bounced that thing without those things on there, I'd have destroyed the left side of that bike. So I am absolutely hell yes on engine guards and crash bars. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's the first thing, like I said, I did it to the Rebel. It was the first thing I did to the um, Lowrider. And a big pointer, they can't be the aesthetic ones. They have to be the ones that actually work. I can't remember who's... It was a big video that we saw. Somebody laid their bike down and actually smashed the engine guards into the engine. And I can't remember whose video it was. But they, they hit the bike so... Oh, it was uh, Doodle. Oh, it was Doodle. Smashed the engine guard so hard into the side of her brand new motorcycle that it was touching the engine. Just from dropping in her driveway. Not crashing the bike. I, just, I don't know that the... Driveway. It's not that they were like not... The correct ones i think she was doing drop like what do you call it drop squats oh, like she was picking up and dropping her bike and crap she, yeah she did like a hundred days of picking my bike up so she was intentionally dropping it on its side and then picking it up i think she was laying but, it down not dropping it well right but she laid even, tires as she I mean, laid I think tires still it, to, even at that uh, point yeah but even then, at that point i dropped a, two, a 900 pound bike going 20 miles an hour and it didn't so I think there's a point there where you need to actually get some that work that are not actually just aesthetic. Sounds like well, sounds like you're throwing shade at the Triumph Company and their uh, their, well, their product line. She got better ones after that, and they actually work. And I and I will, you know. There's and there's a lot of companies that'll do that. They'll make stuff that's aesthetic and say, look what look what I've done. Uh, has anyone seen the new Fortnite video about body armor? Yeah, I did, and I figured we'd bring it up. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, but. Yeah, literally the um, the CE armor, the elbow armor and stuff, literally serves no purpose. It's useless. Um, may may protect you from a bruise, but what was he saying? So the average the average um, armor protects you up to four pounds, and the average drop is something between it, eighteen yeah, and twenty four pounds. It wasn't pounds. It was uh, what it was they, one of their metric measurements. Yeah, but yeah, no, things? like you needed so. I, I, I liked the points he made, but I don't necessarily like that it's encouraging people to be like to go without gear because I think that's a step like it's a really slippery slope where I do think there's some abrasion resistance and like it does a little bit more than you know actually a lot more than just like wearing a t shirt. Um, so I think, I think, I think there's some actually- value. I think he was just talking about going without the elbow pads in it, not no, the, I know, not but- the jacket itself. Right. So I think it's still beneficial to wear it, but the, the, the fact of like, yeah, no, it's not going to necessarily save you from snapping bones. Um, you'd have to have a much higher safety rating. And the main takeaway was that the safety ratings were, were put in place by the industry and they're like less than the minimum requirement to actually be safe. But, and like the, the prime example is that in horse, uh, what do you call it? Horse show, horse, whatever you call it. The question, like stuff. they, yeah, equestrian stuff. Like they wear uh, armor that like act is much higher rated, just because that that industry actually values breaking, not breaking bones. Um, which is weird because they don't go hundred plus miles an hour occasionally. But yeah, when you fall off that horse, it hurts a lot. Yeah. Oh and no. Then the horse not, 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 yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Horses are taller than and heavier than most bikes. Given Clutch Queen is nice having you, man. He did say something at the end that I cannot remember how he phrased it. But basically said, in the end, um, and it's like we say, you know, you, you dress for the thrill, um, but but you dress to be comfortable. Um, and if you're not, and, and we've all, on a short ride, probably, you know, on a hooligan ride running around, elbow armor, um, shoulder armor, not that uncomfortable. 
when you're on the road for juice, how long does it take to get from Michigan down to Forgotten Angels? Uh, I mean, yeah, if I, I haven't done that on a bike yet, but it's 18 hours. Um, I pulled that would, the first That would actually time. be, um, until I get down into Florida, I would probably be wearing my jacket with padded armor, though, to be honest. If I, I, was cannot, I cannot tell you how painful. So I took a four-hour ride um, with the uh, just the elbow armor in. I cannot tell you how pain. It was like someone was slamming my elbows with a hammer. Just not even, you know, moving around a lot, just pushing into it. Imagine, and it felt a lot like pushing your elbows into a brick wall. Imagine doing push-ups and you're just holding yourself up on your knuckles. That's what yeah. it felt like. And, and when I got down, when I got down to Little Circus, I was like, I'm taking this shit out. I'm not doing this. I could not imagine going all the way to Forgotten Angels with that shit in. No, the, the heat definitely also plays a big, big factor in yeah. comfortability with wearing pads too, because you're just adding additional like friction. And the back yeah. armor, absolutely. It's it's com- It's not uncomfortable. It would save you if you fall. But I, I think, and he made up. He made a lot of good points in that video. Um, they used to have back in the evil can evil days, and when they, people were doing jumps, they had forearm armor. You couldn't yeah. even tell it was there. It literally would just fold around your arm. It would get hot, obviously. But now they basically dialed their way back now to just elbow armor. Which literally doesn't do you a whole lot of good. I mean, I mean, it might, again, it might keep you from bumping your elbow, um, but it's so uncomfortable, it's so ungainly, and it's it's a step back from what we used to have. So, who here has ever played baseball and had to be a catcher? The, ca- the catcher's knee pads are very comfortable because they've been in the right places. They're what do you? What's the word? That they're articulated. I couldn't imagine if those were not articulated and they were just stiff. You would I die. Would, I would say catcher pads can be comfortable unless they're older than your father. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with that? Mm. I do have a leather jacket that's older through, than you. <laughs> that's probably true, but when the pads are worn through, they're not that fun to True. Be well, then they're not safe anymore. But, but you get my point, though. Um, if they were designed better and they were actually designed to move, I think we'd have a better product and no one has stepped up to that plate yet. Again, that was something they made 30, 40 years ago. They made armor that actually was for your, for your forearms, for your outer, you know, upper humerus. They don't make that stuff anymore because it costs too much and it's easy to sell the same thing. And, and maybe that's what Fortnite was trying to get to Ryan was that if, if you, if you centralize it to say that you're being safe and here's what everybody has to do, but it's cheap to me and I can make it for you, but everybody has to do it. I've profited from that. Now I don't have to make stuff that actually works. I can make stuff that's cheap to make. Because I mean, making a piece of plastic that's this big to go in each elbow is a lot easier than making a piece of plastic that's that big that has to go, you know, in the form of a suit. And I have to, I would have to use more material. I would have to use more um, textiles to actually make the jacket because the jacket would have to be bigger. So yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff that go, that goes into play with the production stuff. Speaking of speaking of textiles, I think we can bring in a a comment from our, our good buddy, Jack. So do we get a big hell yeah or a hat a layer down for bunny suits or really any uh, onesies what was when the you're out one? riding? What was the middle one? What did practical? we come up Practical. Practical. I'd say practical. I, I think onesies, and I think they're they're hell yeah for me. Hell yeah. I give it a hell yeah. And that and things that are tangentially related to it. Absolutely. All right. So what else do we so what else do we have on the let's stick this in our garage thing? I think we're kind of already on the path of it, but uh, battery tenders. Hell yeah. Ne- necessity where I live. <laughs> I'm gonna juice, I'm gonna imagine it's the same for you. I don't know that I give it a hell yeah, it's practical. It's a practical item. Nope. Somebody was mentioning earlier, and I've seen this a lot of times, so Anybody that's ever been in the Navy, when you deploy, you park your car up. And if you come back and it hasn't been on charge for a long time and they try to charge it real quick and you got to drive it, two or three days later, the battery explodes because you're so overheating the battery from rush charge um, that it just, you cook the battery. Now the plates are all connected and the next thing you know, three or four days later, they explode. Um, the battery tender will keep it under a, one, it keeps your battery charged, but two, it's an ongoing charge that the battery never has to get really hot because it's always right on the verge of being totally charged. 
it's a lot safer for the battery and you get a lot of longevity out of the battery and some of these batteries man unless you go down to shade tree's favorite battery shop some of these batteries are 150 bucks 200 bucks so yeah. that's a lot of money yeah, I will say the the tender itself might be a more practical thing, and it might not be as glamorous. I'll say what does make me go hell yeah is that when I turn the key and I hit the button to start up the engine, and that bike has not moved in three months, hell and it yeah. fires right up, and I get to hear it and feel like all is right with the world again. Yeah, that's a hell yeah moment for me. Definitely, I would agree with that. I'm on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> And, I, and I'll also part the other thing people used to do was actually just go out and start the battery, the bike once a week. That is actually huh? unsafe because yeah. as we've learned in previous years, back in the breather days where you had check valves and engines and back when engines were actually made to route less forever, there were, che there were check valves and there were seeds, uh, you know, the uh, PCV valves to keep moisture from getting in the engine and keep air from flowing back into the crankcase. Those things don't exist anymore. I can't tell you the last time I've replaced, you used to have to replace PCV valves all the time. I don't even put them out of cars anymore. Yeah. So as soon as you start that engine, it's cold, it's pulling atmospheric air in, and if it's cold outside, you're pulling moisture into the engine. And if you don't run the bike long enough to actually make it hot and start expelling all the moisture out of the air that's inside the crankcase, you basically start rusting up the inside of the engine case, which is kind of scary. So your, your crank, your pistons, all of your, your bearings, you know, get wasted and you get moisture in the oil, which obviously we all know is bad. I, I'm not going to disagree with you on this. Cause I think that is a great point, but there's a big, but here, isn't it worth it though, to hear your bike in the dead of winter though? I know Absolutely. you run it whenever, but like, okay, Absolutely. for us, it's like, that is awesome. Yeah. I don't care. I'll run it for 10 minutes or so. That's probably not long enough. I think you really, you got to get the tire moving too, to get all, you know, every fluid moving, but um, yeah. usually we're not doing that. Yeah. They say, you know, they say to get, to get the bike up to operating temperature is, is, is safe. But again, that's your engine is, your crankcase is, not you know, maybe if you don't turn the crankcase over. So if you have a split engine, you know, if you have one of those three-hole bang fests, I, I think your road king is. Um, maybe it it's is. safe to do that. But, yeah, you know, if it shares... No, I mean, it's, got a, it's got a breather, though. I mean, it, it's you, you still run into the same moisture problem. I mean, it's a really great point. A lot of people don't think about that. Yeah. My understanding, too, is that it's not actually great for the battery. The reason being is that when you do that you're drawing from it in order to fire up the starter motor and you're not actually running the alternator long enough to kind of make up that. I mean, doing it once or twice, it's not going to, you know, at first it's not really going to hurt anything necessarily, but a lot of times over the years, over time, that will reduce your battery life because you're actually, you're actually drawing more energy from it and then having to recharge it, which produces life because you're not like the alternator can't do its thing. Essentially, you're not running it for long enough. And the flip side of that is, um, again, I learned this working on forklifts. So Toy Toyota and uh, Cat forklifts do this. They won't start actually charging back to the battery. The alternator stands for getting bat battery power back until it reaches above 2,000 RPM. And that is a this is a voltage differential off of the alternator. So, yeah, you're, you're putting out like 13 volts when the thing is just running. To get it up to 14, you actually have to be driving it to get it above 2,000 RPMs. So you could be sense. running it for 15, 20 minutes. You're not actually charging the battery at all. You're not putting any battery voltage back to it. Yeah. For the mental health boost, hell yeah. But, no, for, the, uh, but, but for the health of the actual engine, bike, and battery, and other components, yeah, n no. But for those of us that live in Mississippi, I ride it every day. Oh, hell, nice. yeah, hell yeah, Sal, <laughs> if I have to. Which I was actually thinking to, this morning, I was like, I, I drove the bike that day because I hadn't drove it in, in seven days. And the flip side of that was then I didn't get to ride that bike for 48 days. Yeah. So, shit happens. You got to watch out for them ice clippings. No, I mean, ice, ice clippings are dangerous, man. To all things, there is a cost. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, Yankee, you got another one for us? I think it's your turn. Okay. Um... Something that I used to think was, oh, uh, you know, have, have to lay, have to lay it down. Uh, who needs that? You know, be a man and you know, just take it. But then once I got it and started using it, and went, oh, I actually can't live without this now. Windshield. On my absolutely. 
Sounds sounds kind of silly, but when I, you know, my first bike was a Honda Shadow 750. They don't come with one. I rode around without one, and I was like, oh, it's it's fine. You just take the take the wind on your chest like a man, you know. And yeah, don't don't mind the fact that I'm basically dying after a 600 mile ride. That's not important. But and then when I remember, I got one. I got the Scout. Got one for the Scout. For the first five minutes, I hated it because I felt like it was messing with the handling of the bike a little bit. bit and I was like, this sucks. I can't, you know, I'm still feeling buffing off the top of my helmet. And then one day I rode it for more than an hour, <laughs> like closer to two hours. And I was like, oh, I'm actually not getting fatigued at all. I could do this forever. Sam Lau reference. <laughs> yeah, you, just, you don't but, uh, realize how much that wind is pushing on your head until it's not. Well, you it's just off, like your, chip, your whole body. Well, I used to think, you know, you get off a bike after a really long ride, and it's like, man, my throat is sore. You know, I'm sore right here. It must be from breathing all the wind and swallowing bugs. And then you realize it's from fighting an 80-mile-an-hour wind on your forehead, and your muscles are trying to hold your head up straight. Yeah. Again, the things you don't realize, it, it's like walking around with a backpack on all day and then you take it off and you're like, damn, that was heavy. You don't realize it until you take it off. You don't have yeah. that strain anymore. And especially, too, if you're on a bike, the Scout, the, the Shadow had this to a small extent, but the Scout really had it when I first got it before I put the new bars on it. If you're leaned forward at all, you know, you're catching, and especially, you know, I got a kind of a tall chest. I'm catching all the wind with my chest all day by the by the end of the ride, it felt like I could barely even hang on to the thing anymore because of my arms are so tired. I've been, you know, just just fighting that wind. It feels like it's trying to just throw you right off the bike. And yeah, it just really, really wears on you. But once I once I put that windshield on, it's like I am just daylight and biological need for sleep. Those are my only limitations now. That reminds me of an old, I'm talking an old Easy Rider cartoon where it was like why why younger guys uh, can ride without a windshield and the older guys can't. And the young guy's leaning over and he's got his big chest hanging out and his waist is small so the so the air is running like this down his body and lifting <laughs> him up. And then it shows this big fat dude with his belly hanging out and the wind is like this over his belly and then riding up and like this so the wind's pushing him backwards. Good times. Not that I'm saying yeah. anything, but I just think that was a funny cartoon. No, that, that's... Okay. <laughs> I get a big, big hell yeah for, for windshields, but I will raise you this counterpoint. If you're just be bopping around town and you normally have your windshield on, there's nothing more hell yeah than taking the windshield off because it just completely changes the look of the bike. I mean, I'm, I'm talking from personal experience here. On the Road King, like, I love riding that bike around on the highway with the windshield, but you take that off and you show off all the glorious chrome, which is awesome and not nasty, Aaron. Um, and it looks cool. And you don't have that windshield in the way. Hell yeah. Especially Hell when it's yeah. 100 degrees. It's 100 degrees. Oh it does gosh. feel magnificent yeah. without the windshield on. But Fair. Again. I can, yeah, I can definitely say since getting the uh, low rider in the middle of summer last year, I went from all the airflow on a nice 90 degree day to I felt like I was melting inside my helmet. But most most good windshields now and fairings have vents on them. Yeah. So you, you can kind of get over it real quick. But that's why I like, that's why I like which one? This one. Uh, it's small. The air can still get around me, and it'll buff it probably probably eighty percent of the shield or of, of the wind. But I can still actually get some wind on me, so it's not that too bad a thing. It just sucks in the winter. That twenty percent that still gets around in the winter kind of sucks. I'll throw you this uh, too, Aaron. You know, if I uh, recall my most recent trip to Forgotten Angels recently, I might recall some folks pulling away on a Heritage that did not have the windshield on it. And I thought that that overall look was pretty dang cool, if I do say so. Yeah, I don't know if Melissa asked Parker to do that or if Parker just did it. But yes, Melissa took I think she had it off earlier in the day. Yeah, it was, it was already off. But... Okay. Well, I know when we first got there and then we uh, went out on a little ride and she rode the Heritage the first time, Parker took it off. So I'm going to guess and speculate that Melissa asked her if she would take it off because she has yet to put a windshield on her shadow. She has one. She bought one to put on. And then she looked at me and said, so you're going to put this on, right? And I'm like, yeah, eventually. I've been it's easy. I've been Remember waiting. the Loctite. I have been waiting for a day that's not like 30 degrees to go do it because I don't particularly yeah. want to be outside in a garage for an hour in 30 degree weather. 
I've been pampered too much with the Florida weather. Understandable. Mm. But uh, she's going to go from riding that heritage to the next chance she gets of getting on her shadow. She's going to ride it and be like, it's not, it's not as fast. It's not as powerful. Yeah. So Heritage is a really smooth bike, too. I, I do enjoy that bike. I, I mean, I, it wasn't my choice between the Road King and the Heritage, but it's a really nice bike. You're also six foot five of the world's largest hobbit. It's true, but I'm just saying, I, t- I did, t- I, I have ridden one, and it's, it is nice. I can confirm that. Yeah. So she says that uh, she's not getting rid of the shadow this year because she almost has it paid off. Well, that, that is probably really smart. Mm-hmm. Do that first. So not this year, but I think maybe next year. Because this year she's doing her first out-of-state trip, which is part of the reason why she wants a windshield on her bike. And so, is, is hers a 650, a 650 or a 700? 650. 650. I'm sorry, 650. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a 2013 Shadow 650. Okay. No, they made a 650. Uh, I don't know. Six, the, hang on, they made a 600 and a 750. That's what it was. Yeah, that's that's what I probably thought. Is, so probably the 750 then. I don't. Yeah, it's not my bike. I don't know the details. I will remind you that I'm old and I'm liable to forget shit because that's just how I am now. And I have a perfect excuse. Fucking old. And not too terribly long ago, you did smack your head, so things might still be a little jumbled. Exactly. That's my that's my excuse. Thank you, Nar. You're a great friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next on our list, and this is one that's near and dear to me, and I'm not sure if anybody else has this, but the sheepskin seat covers. Absolutely magnificent. And I laughed at them before until um, in the winter, they keep it, they keep you from sitting on a cold seat. In the summer, they keep you from sitting on a hot seat. And when it rains, they're water repellent, and all you have to do is wipe, knock your hand off on them, and all the water comes right off. Absolutely, 100%. Hell yeah, brother. So I actually bought this sheepskin like forever ago with the intention of cutting it more to shape and putting straps on it so I could put it on and off of the seat for the low rider. And as we can see, it has kind of permanently become part of my office chair. If you take it to a tailor shop, they will put the buckles and snaps on it for you. And uh, you know, they're, they're prepared for that kind of thing. Eh, I want to do it myself. So I think cool. what I'm going to end up doing is ordering another one to go on the bike. Or you another can just sew it to there. the back of your pants, and it's always there. <laughs> Those can be your riding pants. So, fun history lesson real quick. Uh, the So, if anyone like me enjoys fantasy, medieval <coughs> stuff, uh, I when it came out the show Vikings on the History Channel, the main character was uh, Ragnar Lothbrook. Lothbrook was not a family name. It was a title given to people that specifically wore furry pants because Lothbrook translates to furry pants. <laughs> so That's if I make nice. sheepskin furry pants, I'm going to have to get a new road name. Boots Whitaker. <laughs> you would, dude. <laughs> Fur legs. But I haven't ridden with a uh, a sheepskin seat cover yet, so I can't really give an opinion on it. Me neither. And I think they look cool, and I, I get, I understand the practical function of it. But yeah, you, Sid, and uh, Josh, Shade Tree Surgeon, are the only ones I know that have, have that I can think of that have used them. And you Josh's looks very gross and oily and like because his, like gr- his gross and oily. No, you run on my <laughs> campground. I mean, it's it's more cushion. It's actually a lot more shock absorbent. Um, but it's airflow. It's, it's hard to get an appropriate opinion on under a ten minute ride. True. Um, the amount of airflow, and I, I notice this immediately putting on um, because the seat that's on it is almost smooth leather, and it, it's leather. With that sheepskin on it, you get so much more airflow <laughs> under you. Let's just put it that way. So it was, it's such a cooler ride. Keeping, I'm, I'm going to hijack this for just a second. Keeping in line with something to put on your seat, air pad and or gel pad, 
yeah. definite must for it's any type stuff. of longer ride and or a long distance travel. I do not care how nice your suspension is or how nice your seat is. After six hours of being in the same position and having the same pressure points on your butt, having a gel pad or an air pad, I, I like my air pad because I can, in the middle of the ride, I'm like, oh, my butt's certain. I just reach down, I twist the air nozzle on it, it lets the air out, different pressure points in my butt cheeks. It helps me ride farther for longer. You know what's even better than that? Gel pad underwear. Oh my gosh. No no I plugs. Have, no plugs. I have <laughs> had someone in the past before you did your commercial with that company. I've had someone tell me riding shorts like you would use for, you know, bicycling long distance will also go a long way with that. Yeah, and, they, and that's what these are. Originally they have the company sold bicycle gear and Basically, it is the bicycle shorts. It's just thicker and it covers more area because obviously you're going to hit a lot of um, harder bumps going 80 and 90 than you will it going, you know, 30 or 40. So it's just it's just a beefed up bicycle shorts so, is what it is. So for some type of seat additive, I'm going to say hell yeah or hell, what was it? Was it hell yeah, brother. It, it, hell yeah, hell yeah, practical or had a layer down. For me, I don't know that it's quite a hell yeah, but I have used the air pad. We, I think we have the exact same one. Mm -hmm. um, that made my trip on when I had the Kawasaki Concourse. That made it bearable for me because I like it ergonomically. <laughs> it's close, but it's not great. Um, but I can definitely agree with that and that sentiment about um, gel seats kind of is the alternative to that. That's why I just got to say I'm going to step up because they have gel in them. I don't know good, bad, or otherwise the long-term comfort of that seat yet, but I think it looks cool. And it has that gel feature, so I really hope it does help. So, I also have a Sidemen. I don't know if it has gel in it or not, because I bought it secondhand. But even with that, I have noticed that on three-plus-hour rides, I do like to still have access to the air. Still, yeah, just be able to change the pressure pressure points. That air that air seat, like, that that rocks. Yeah, I don't have much of a butt. If I had, like, a biker paid fat butt, I'd probably do a lot better. Dude, Dude I got the thumbs-up thing now. You'd have more yeah. followers. I just saw it do it. Hell yeah. Oh, because you're on oh. your phone. <laughs> Hell yeah. Because yeah, that's that's right. you're on your phone. So, yeah, oh, shit, that's cool. I'm going off, dude. What's your opinion on it? <laughs> um, so I have not made any modifications to my seat yet. All that really proves is just how stupid I am. Because on my 12-hour plus rides that you all keep making me do... You oh, oh, hold up, hold up. Bastards! We, we invite you and you choose to do that. Stop using logic. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, yeah, so, all, but all getting aside, yes, as you guys know, my rides out to do these meetups are pretty long because I'm kind of up here in a corner. And I actually, a sheepskin seat has long been on the list of like, intermediate mods that I want to make to the bike. Uh, my eventual solution is I would like to get a just a, a full-on much better seat for the bike. Probably Corbin. Be, that's my most realistic option. I know some people love them, some people hate them. I would get a Saddleman step up, but as I've stated numerous times, for reasons that just remain unknown to us mere mortals, uh, Saddleman will make step-up seats for the Scout bobber, but not the regular Scout. With the full rear fender, with the full rear fender, that, like I have, that makes I, no sense. I've I don't know. Thought, I've always thought Mustang made the best cruiser seats because they're wide, um, and they're very plush. Um, I I've had, always love Mustang seats. All I had a Mustang seat on the Shadow. Um, the previous owner had actually had that put on there, and I, well, I very much liked it. Their options for the Scout are a little more limited. Plus, I, I've heard like mixed reports on their quality over the past couple of years, but it I don't I can't confirm or deny this, but it might have taken a hit with the pandemic. It sort of sounds like it did. Uh funnily enough, they're not far from me. I think they're their plan is like where, where are they out of like Chicopee or something like that? Chicopee Mass? They're they're near, they're near me. Um but one thing I did kind of like about the core, because I like the, the seat that's on my Scout, I like the style of it, where it kind of has that, that like, saddle gunfighter-looking thing. And I know Corbin does make one 
that I think they call the Brave, but on other bikes it's called the Gunfighter. And I, I'm going to interject like right the, here real quick for Yankee. From experience, I had a Corbin on the Rebel. Not worth it. It'll scratch your tank, rub the finish off. It'll scratch the frame where it rests against. It'll um, rub against your rear fender aggressively. Uh, and it's not just been my Rebel 500. A lot of Corbin seats in the last two, three years that people have been buying. People have been sharing pictures, sharing videos, talking about it in forms. The Corbin seats have been damaging the finishes on bikes the last few years. So really? I don't know if they're having an issue with quality control. I don't know if they've gotten, oh, we're such a good name brand now that we're just going to not care. It, I, I don't want to say anything bad about the brand, but from my personal experience, the Corbin ruined not just the finish, but the paint as well. It, it went through the finish and went through the paint straight down to bare metal on multiple parts of the Rebel when I had it. Um, I know I mean, that Rebel was like a show bike, though. <laughs> well, I also know that um, a slow bike? On YouTube, there's a YouTuber, uh, Life of Birch. He's a huge Honda mm. guy. He had uh, one of the very first Corbin, I think it was a Corbin Gunfighter seats for the uh, Rebel 1100. And within the first few weeks of having it on his bike, it had rubbed through the black finish on the like bar under the seat that's part of the frame. Hmm. So, oh, and my Corbin, it took 2,000 miles for the seat to break in, and then it was comfortable until I hit 10,000, and then after 10,000 miles, that seat was no longer comfortable. Hmm. All right. Well, that is weird because I had heard you're not the only person actually to tell me that Corbin is might might be a mess too. So I can can definitely look around, but I don't know what other options are available. Uh, what I can't the one thing I can confirm for it is that the stock seat on that Scout is hot garbage. Like it sucks. <laughs> so, thankfully, I do got some I got some big pads back here, so that I think does help me out a little bit. But you know. Which one but, did you um, say was closer to you, Corbin or Mustang? What'd you say, Rainy? The Yankee. Which one did you say was close to you, Corbin or Mustang? Mustang. So I would write them and say you have a bike that they don't make seats for and ask if they would uh, consider your bike for a trial bike. No, they make they make seats for the Scout. It's a uh, Saddleman that doesn't. They don't make the step up for the regular okay. Scout, and like literally nobody knows why. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And Saddleman is specific to think Florida, but they have a distribution center as well in California. Right. I think all of their seats are made in Florida. I did all that for nothing. <laughs> I was I was looking up the contact information because they do take bikes in for um, exhibition bikes. Mm -hmm. And if you, um, so Viking does that too. And they look specifically for certain bikes to test their, their seats and stuff on. And they're in, in their bags and stuff too. But uh, very cool. Speaking of life of Birch, though, did anybody see this brings up another nice to have cool thing? Um, did anybody see his thing on the pants? And he was yeah, really busting Yemi thing. on Yammy Noob. And, and I'll say this those Wings pants I have, they're thick. They are much, much denser than denim, but they're also cooler than denim. But they did a good job on those pants. And again, that, that thing he kept saying, well, they're just. You know, mostly cotton and lycra. Well, that's what denim is. Congratulations, you 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 found the combination of things that actually make denim. Um, but yeah, they're more comfortable, they're thicker, and they're more protective than denim. So I think if anything, that would be a selling point. Yeah, I I remember when Birch first got the what's the NBT is what he wears the NBT pants from them and started wearing them, talking about them and. I've, I've been thinking, in the, like, when I do finally get a pair of riding pants, specifically for riding with the armor and all that, that's where I would go. So, uh, obviously, S S Steve hates them, but as far as dedicated riding pants, I don't wear, j so just like these Ironworker pants that I was telling Juice about, I don't wear those everywhere. But if I'm going to be in the saddle longer than four or five hours, I'm going to wear the riding pants, because guess what? They're engineered for riding for a really long time. So it makes your experience that much better. Did they look a little? Did they look a little weird? Yeah, they're they're a little clingy in places that you wouldn't like your jeans to normally be clingy in. But uh, I don't I don't wear those gel underwear all over the place either. I just wear those on long rides. So purpose driven things for purpose purposes, 
And, and that's what I'm saying. Some of these things, again, like all these things we're talking about, some of these things, they're not going to be practical every day. They're going to serve the purpose you need them to when you need them to. Very good. With that, what's what our other, next thing? I was just thinking of like, yeah, I was going to say, what is our next thing? <laughs> okay, so how about, and this is something that I always carry, and I have one in each bag, uh, dedicated tool rows for your bike. Those are that would definitely be a practical thing, and I definitely need one because I, I I usually am the kind of person that just I just grab a handful of tools when I'm going on a trip. Maybe if I can fit them in another bag, I do that. But having like an organized tool roll makes so much sense. But my ADHD brain, I'm just like yeah, whatever, and I just chuck it in the saddlebag. And it's fine. I got a generic from Revzel. I got a generic like Harley roll toolkit that should be good for all. Not just Harley, but like American made motorcycles uh, right before the last October's camp out because I knew it was going to be down there for a week. And I was like, on the off chance something happens, I have tools. Yeah, 90% of the time, you need a 10 millimeter, miller, an 8 millimeter, a uh, 4 millimeter Allen, and a Crescent T45. And a T45 or a T25 if you got a BMW. You literally with a hand now I've got obviously have a lot more than, than that in my tool roll for the BMW, but literally the it's the same five wrenches I take out every time I do anything on that bike. And if you're on the side of the road, or God forbid, the whiskey changers not in here, but God forbid you get to a gas station and find out that your crankcase is half full of water and you have to do an oil change on the side of the road, you'll be thankful you had those tools. You did it in a gas station, a seven eleven parking lot. Yeah, they have gas. You know, he poured the chocolate milk out of his crankcase. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, you guys with open intakes, muslin bags. Do any of you have muslin bags for your intakes? Is I that do. A rain cover, like a rain sock. Yeah. It's a rain sock. Yeah. Then yeah. It's a hydro. It's a hydrophobic sheet, is what it is. It lets only air in and not water. I'm gonna disagree with that. When I came home last October with Devin, and we rode through the mountains of West Virginia through all the rain, into the cloud and all that, water still got through it into my air intake. It probably went past its saturation limit. Did you get it from because... Wish? No, I got it from Harley. There's a problem. Um, but it's the one meant to fit my, uh, what was it, high flow air intake. But yeah, was, we were somewhere in the mountains of West Virginia in the clouds, literally in the actual clouds. And all of a sudden, I'm riding, and then it's just like, pa, 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 Yeah. So. Normally, they engineer when they sell the bike. That's the most efficient and the, the most, you know, perfect that bike is. And it was surprising to me that they started selling them with that weird-ass looking intake on it. Because... It looks, it looks nice, and it's good for around town. But the moment you want to go for longer than, like, two hours, three hours, and you want to try to have somewhere to put your legs, it doesn't work. So this, so like the sports shirt, like the the sports shirt airbox cover that everybody complains about, like uh, Shay was complaining about it, the round one. Those are designed to spin the air as it comes in, like most airboxes are. Your car was, is designed the same way to spin the air. That way, all the moisture goes to the outside, and the air comes down the middle of the little tornado that it makes. And with those, there isn't, no, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen. It just sucks whatever's there gets sucked into the engine. And it was kind of crazy to me they even put that thing on a bike. First time I saw one, I thought it was an aftermarket thing. It's like, somebody must have put this on. And, and it kind uh, of looks like the one on Justin's. Yeah. I got the K&N. <laughs> it's K&N. All hell k and K&N. K&N. It's K&N. Do you remember those commercials? Uh, no, I, I think it's a great point about the rain sock. I'm not, I know I have one somewhere. I need to probably find it. I will say in a light rain situation, I'm not stopping to put that on. Um, it would have to be a pretty heavy downpour, and just the way that the air flows around my bike, it's not a problem most of the time, even if it's raining. But if you let, it's 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 good to have that. Um, if you're gonna let it sit and it's during a rainstorm, you should have that. Big thumbs up there. Um, and then, you know, in a heavier downpour, if you happen to be raining, probably a good idea to throw that on. I'll throw in that there is a difference in a rain sock and a muslin bag. The muslin bag is hydrophobic. So if you have the chance, if you're actually going to get one aftermarket, don't get something called a rain sock. Or basically, it's just a sock. Um, actually, no, the, the one I've got is like a, it's a high, whatever, high, hydrophobic. hydrophobic. Hydrophobic sheet. Okay. And, and yeah. you've got, you've got, a, I mean, that's like, you know, the difference in getting oil and getting 
you know, motor oil. It's it's definitely going to be a different thing. So yeah. you, you can go get regular fifty weight from your for your for your lawnmower. It's definitely going to be different than what you're going to want to put in your actual engine. So just be. Who was it? So uh, Chase actually took the um, neckerchief from any ridge I gave him and actually put it over his air intake and said it actually kept the water out. So go, Steve. Stuff yeah, helps. It works. All right. Let me look at my list of pictures that I can't share, which is it kind of sucks. But oh yeah. Jerry says, yeah. When you're parked, throw a Dollar General bag over your intake. Oh, well. Hell yeah, yeah brother. Yeah, I actually should <laughs> hey. wash. I do that when I wash the bike. I have no experience uh, air intake wise because mine is sitting underneath my gas tank, very, very well protected. Also, a complete pain in the ass to get to. Um, I have actually on one occasion though had a whole bunch of camping gear and whatnot stacked up on my my sissy bar, and I was knew I was going to be driving through a rainstorm, so I actually put a trash bag over it and tied it off at the bottom. Did everybody's uh, screens it, just die for the? It, I'm looking at the YouTube and it, it, oh, yeah. uh, it, it went black. Yeah, it did. Oh, we're worse. back. We're back on YouTube. Okay, so that was weird. Sound, but it, it had all those squares. It had all those squares, but everything else died. Hmm. Crazy. And that, I swear I didn't do that that time. <laughs> no, that's what really uh, killed the whole screen. Just made the whole screen go black. But that, that you was weird. What you said about covering your camping gear in a trash bag. Uh, I I can't remember if it was ever on video, but Beth did the same thing one year on her trip to Bro, except it wasn't just her stuff. It was her stuff and herself. They stopped at a gas station. She got like four or five trash bags and she just like covered all of her stuff and then cut a neck hole in one and put it on. I think that's oh. probably been one of the favorite stories that Nicole or another Lita talked about when it came to Bro. Yeah. Also, one aspect I always uh, like about being on the bike is even on a long, actually, especially on a long trip, to a certain degree, I mean, yes, being wet socks, and I am a big proponent of putting on rain gear if you have it. I'm a big proponent of having quick rain gear that you can put on over existing riding clothes, which is why I basically got, like, my Columbia rain pants and my frog togs jacket that I throw on. But one thing I do often appreciate is that if you're driving through a really nasty rainstorm, you come, especially those summer ones, you come out on the other side of it, you ride for 10, 15 minutes, boy, you're dry again. Yeah. It's one of, just one of life's small more. Yes, there can be exceptions, obviously, yeah. especially if the road's still wet. But more often than not, uh, I have gotten very soaking wet, and then just everything, especially the front of my pants, just dried off nice and went on. Yeah. One of nature's small mercies. Summer, summer rainstorms are awesome sometimes, especially if it's nearing 100 degrees or more. And you hit a good rain shower that cools cools you down to like eighty degrees, yeah. and you don't want rain gear on. It's like this is freaking manna from heaven. I love this. Quick, quick, uh, quick diversion, Rainy. Please tell me if you ever play music on your bike, you have driven through a rainstorm and listened to the cult song, and I don't even have to name what it yes. is. Yes. God damn. God damn right you have. <laughs> yes, I have. And sometimes it's just too funny. If you hear me giggling in my headset, obviously can't hear the. Yeah, but it, it, it's funny that that's on every playlist I have that I go riding on is that yeah. one, and um, what was the other one? It was another rain song that I was I wanted to do at the camp out, but yeah. oh, uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater, who'll stop the rain? Oh yeah, that's a great one. But, yeah, yeah, yeah but man, you get you get to that bridge right as you know you're going actually through the rain, and man, you just you just feel like you're on top of the whole world. There are very anyway. few times I've actually had to stop riding in the rain. Um, and the one time we did stop, so me and Dana were riding back from, I think it was four campouts ago. It was when I made the video uh, Between Two Tornadoes, a love story. And uh, we stopped under a bridge, and it was still raining so hard it didn't matter. We were actually getting wetter sitting there under the bridge because the rain was blowing sideways. I was like, screw it, we're just going to pile the trucks because we were actually drier following trucks that we were sitting off on the side of the road under a bridge. So we just said, screw it, let's go. And we screwed it and we went and we go. Mm -hmm. All right, but back onto our path here. So has anyone seen the, um, the centrifugal force brake lights that go on the back of helmets? I have. Yeah, I don't remember the name of it. Those. I know which one you're talking about though. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the, Newton's, uh, um, the Newton's first law ones. 
doesn't, they come out whenever uh, you break. Doesn't Doodle, doesn't she yeah. have one on, on like all the helmets she's ever had? I've seen an old one that she had one. I think those are of questionable legality in some states. You can't use the colored light ones. You can use the red and white ones. Or you can use the red ones and you can... But uh, yeah, you're not supposed to have the flashing light ones or the ones that strobe. I even outside of that, some states and some states have weird Virginia. laws about their helmets. Like in some states, um, having your GoPro mounted onto your helmet or anything like even our Senas and Cardos, if it's mounted onto your helmet with anything other than double-sided tape, it is then considered a permanent exterior fixture on your helmet and is then considered illegal. Probably California. I don't. Bunch of I can't comments. remember. It is. It's a. It's a stupid misunderstanding of the manufacturing code for helmets and like, yeah, I think there's been court cases about it, but overwhelmingly, most I my experience has been nobody cares about that. So nobody cares. It's a little state dependent. But... Well, it's also not so you, you uh that's like the DOT certification is null and void if you paint the helmet or if you getting any, any stickers yeah. on it. You're not supposed to have stickers on it. So who who backs? I mean, who really will ever pull you over half off if you have a sticker on your helmet? I was gonna say, yeah. you know, like I, I knock on knock on wood, but it's like a lot of, a lot of laws surrounding like motorcycles and gear. Unless it's something blindingly obvious, like you're in a in a helmet law state and not wearing a helmet, um, man, the the cops themselves don't even seem to like know what they are half the time. Anyways, sure. I don't. They just they just don't seem to bother, especially around where I am. But like I said, I could have just cursed myself. But Sydney, not that I break the law ever. Sydney piped in in the chat and said that NYC has that law. And you know they're communist. Well, thank, thank God I'm never going there. <laughs> that's yep. That, that's on my list of places not to go because yeah, I'm an enemy of the state just by breathing. So no. Thanks anyway. Uh, the funny thing is, and I know y'all heard Chase talk about this, but in New York City, to get your registration and to get your um, your inspection done. The bike had to be completely stock. And so people would go put all the stock stuff on the bike, get it inspected, get it home, take all the shit right back off. Yeah. You didn't have to worry about it for a year. Because nobody, because again, nobody backs that stuff up because, like, who knows about this? Even even the motorcycle cops, they won't back it up because they know better than to even just say, screw it. You know, that, it, it's too easy to get out of take like that because all you have to say is, oh, I didn't know. I know a bunch of guys, a uh, bunch of guys who ride choppers up in New Hampshire, hell, half those half those plates don't even go with those bikes. <laughs> it's just some random thing they yeah, picked up. They, so. they like used put a trailer to. right on it or yes. something. Yeah, like it's just... <laughs> California is trying to pass one, and they have been for a long time, and I think New York was trying to do it too, but basically that you couldn't have anything on the bike that did not come from the manufacturer. And they said it was for nuisance and hooligans, and it was, she got... Basically, when the one was, was explaining the law... She turned the other lawmakers off so hard that they were like, no, we're not doing this. Yeah, you thought this was America. She yeah. had so much hate and contempt, even the other lawmakers were like, we're not doing this. If she well, would have if she would have talked her game straight, she probably could have got away with that. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do this. And she, but no, that's her one of her things. She started basically using what the thing when you're when you're trying to convince someone of something, you don't use names. You're, if you're trying to actually have a lively debate, you use facts. As soon as you divert to name calling and to your initial prejudices, it just turns everybody off. And then it just becomes one of these things like, well, I'm doing it because I don't like people. And uh, so, yeah, it didn't pass. Thank God. Yeah, it's, I think it goes along with like what has been happening with a lot of cars people out there in, in Cali is that a lot of their aftermarket exhausts that are a little louder than stock are getting attacked and people who have like sports cars, supercars, are at least for the time they were being essentially followed and targeted by cops for noise violations. And I think that law was trying to follow up on the same instance of that, but instead of the car community into the bike community. Yeah, then as soon as somebody goes to court and pulls a diesel truck into the fray, they just go, okay, never mind. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's stupid in my opinion. I understand part of it is it's because they're like, you know, the emission laws that they're all trying to heavily enforce. 
and that's why new bikes have crappy exhausts now because of emission laws. If anyone with any amount of capability to do some research, they will find that the fumes that are hurting our environments, our ozone, and everything that's causing a lot of the greenhouse effects, more of the issues that affect that come from cow manure than multiple cars. One cow patty creates more methane gas than multiple cars running. So if they really wanted to affect that, they would significantly increase the price of beef and decrease the price of Don't be poultry. about increasing the price of beef, man. Yeah, don't and, don't, don't and, even put that in the universe. So what they, what they don't, here's what they don't tell you, is there's actually more methane put off from the, from the rainforest than there are from any animal. Because it, rainforests are in a constant state of decay. And you know mm -hmm. what? It's good for the environment. It's yep. good. So, because methane, they always focus, that's like saying that, you know, salt is bad for you because it contains, you know, you know, sodium and sodium can kill you. Well, it's not the same thing. It's a totally different chemical cool composition. Same thing when they say CO2, CO2 is going to ruin the atmosphere. You know, CO2 is it's a hot, it's a greenhouse and gas. CO2 is what helps plants grow. Exactly right. It's a greenhouse gas because it helps plants grow. So egg you whites are bad for you. No, egg yolks are bad for you. It's been going back and forth with that for decades. But it, again, you know, even egg yolks are actually good for you because they're sterols. Sterols help you grow. They keep, make you grow big and strong. It doesn't well, make you well, turn into a 30-pound <laughs> vegetarian. So, and I, and I have a vegetarian in my family. Love you to death. But yeah, you need to eat your eggs. So, yeah, just... The, the dangerous thing about a lot of the legislation is they use scientific words that people don't understand and all they have to do is say it's bad and go, oh, well, it must be bad because I don't understand the word. And, it must be a bad thing. And that all goes down to people now being too incapable of researching any topic for themselves. I'm not much of an exception. Like, there's plenty of things I could easily look up in a moment's notice and find answers to, and I don't. And that's part of the issue is we have people that are blindly following anyone in some type of authoritative leadership position that just says loud exhausts are bad it ruins our environment and people are like i agree and that's that's part of the issue and we're seeing it everywhere it's not just in your small towns it's not just in your big cities it's all over the place everywhere as a society people have become dumber and dumber as we have access to more and more goods and services that take care of things for us. I'm a perfect example of all this because what do I know how to do? Not much. Eat? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, sometimes I even question if <laughs> I can do your that. Change damn oil, man. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I can do things, that in my car. See, <laughs> I see things sometimes that I go, my favorite is when they were pushing bioflavonoids, contains bioflavonoids. That sounds so healthy, doesn't it? These grains contain bioflavonoids. You know what a bioflavonoid is? It means it's been enriched mm. with B vitamins. They've been cool. doing that for 100 years, adding B vitamins to grain. That's how, that's how they make the grains more healthy. But if you, say, if you don't say that, if you don't say it's enriched flour, that sounds very generic and, and lab conscious, you know? But if you say it contains bioflavonoids, that sounds like it's healthy for you. You should eat it because it's good for you. No, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to drop all, all your personal information out here in the open. What I will say is that, uh, you and I, you and I very recently were having a conversation about something that relates to just how bad the consequences can be when people accept something, they accept something as evil just because somebody told them it was without actually thinking for themselves. I think I'm forgetting this conversation. Where where was your girlfriend talking about going? Oh, yes. That's all I'll say about that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very easy in this date and time due to the internet to believe something is horrible just because somebody said it was and not do the research yourself. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, so I, I, I've talked about this before. I don't know if I've talked to you guys. There was actually in, and I think it was Ber uh, Berkeley, 
or okay, it could have been UCLA, that they were doing um, experiments. They were doing social experiments back in the 70s and 80s, and they would make up these very realistic looking posters that you see like in health class and that you see hanging in you know, the airport and stuff like that. Very realistic looking ones. And one that they made that said uh, onions will start to destroy or, or turn into toxins four days after you cut them. Any onion that's older than three days should be thrown away because they become poisonous. That was the, a poster they made up. It was totally make-believe. That poster still pops up on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, I mean, on, it, onions attract it's, ogres. It's you can't have 40, those outside. It's 40 years old. People still believe it. They have layers. Yeah, and they have layers. I mean, but they dangerous. Would do things, but they would do no. things like that every year. They would have whole classes. They'd make things up, and they'd put them out. And then they would, like... It, the weird thing is it started in California. And then yeah, they would big have onion they, country. Well, they would have those up, and it wasn't just onions. It was all kinds of weird things they would make up. And then they would go, they'd be up for the whole first semester. And then at the end of the second semester, they start asking people, hey, what do you know about this? And they'd be, be quoting facts off of these poster boards that were up, you know, four months before. But they were quoting these things like they were a rule. This was science. And the only place they saw it was on these billboards as they walked through, you know, college, college dorm rooms and college halls and in the lunch rooms. But just they saw these things and just so understood hey, them as fact. I want I want to ask you something Go ahead. because I've heard this old wives' tale, which is probably older than you, but you are older than me. So that's I'm doubtful. But the, go ahead. I'm asking the elder of this group for some wisdom. Go for it. I've always been told since I was a little kid, if you get a really bad cold, the flu, or something, take an onion, cut it in half, and put it on your end table for the next few nights, because onions absorb bacteria. Is that true? Uh, I have never heard that. What I have heard and I do know is true is if you get a cold, if you get any kind of bacterial infection and eat a clove of garlic, you will literally heal like overnight. Hmm. That I do know and that is fact. Well, I love me garlic, so uh, that's good to know. It will literally I'm pretty sure it. cold is a virus, as is the flu. Choose, uh, just, I'm telling you, do it. Do it, and it will help you. I promise you. So, I, man, I, I, yeah. I, I need to see the science on it, and I might need to just try some garlic. I said do it. I'm not so for eating garlic. Here's, so here's, yeah, here's, mean, here's what the Egyptians used to do. They would take uh, garlic, kind of par crush it, put it in a jar and fill it with honey, and when they would get yeah. sick, they would, they would eat this crushed gut garlic that was in honey, and that was the cure. I, I've it was that. delicious. I've heard it it's also like delicious. a digestive supplement. Garlic is good for a lot of things. Garlic is also, um, and this is weird, has anybody heard of um, Rasmussen? Was his name Rasmussen? The Russian guy. Rasputin? Rasputin. Yeah, Rasputin. They tried to poison Rasputin with arsenic and um, basically gave him kind of a stomach ache for a little bit. And then he was fine because he ate so much garlic every day that it actually nullified the toxins in his body. Also, apparently... Read up on that. That's actually a fact. Yeah. Apparently, natural honey, in general, is also extremely good for your body. Yes. It's good yeah, for helping your liver synthesis. It's good for helping oh, your detox your system. It's apparently way better. Uh, like, a little bit of honey with, like, a little bit of salt is apparently, like, some type of super hack for people trying to get into lifting. It's apparently because you have the sugars to hit you immediately, like, your caffeine would for your pre-workout. You have the salts that help you stay hydrated during and after your workout. And it's like, I just found all this information that makes honey like this super... It's a super, super food. food. I do know yeah. that gymnasts and cyclists will use honey to uh, prevent cramping. If they start cramping during during their, um, their practice, they'll eat honey and to make the cramping go away. I didn't know that. One, One thing, thing I always... Sorry, go ahead, Nar. Go ahead, Yankee. Um, one thing that I always heard growing up too was that if you're if it's allergy season, uh, especially thick pollen, and you're having really bad allergies, if you eat honey that was produced locally, it will actually help your immune system adjust because it contains a lot of that same, you know, the compounds that are going to be in that local pollen, and it's actually it will help you get past allergies. Um, is that true? I'm not 100% sure, but I always like whole wheat toast with honey for breakfast, so I'm not going to complain. It is true. It's like an antivirus. So when bees process the pollen, it actually makes an antivirus to the pollen. So 
Sentinel chimed in from the chat. She says, garlic thing, while not medically proven, is used in a lot of Polish remedies. I believe it. I believe it, but it's only because it worked when my grandma gave it to me. Yeah. I say the old remedies, there's a lot to these old remedies. I mean, before we had lab laboratories, we had centuries and centuries of testing. And the funny thing is, we've had, you know, millennia of testing and what worked and healed people. And then all of a sudden, we have 50 years of laboratory experiments. And we're like, oh, well, let's, let's believe that instead. Something so I'm, else. I'm obviously biased. The, something that I'll say I've always heard is an old wife tale growing up that a cousin of mine, finally, a much older than cousin, convinced me to do one year when I had really bad strep throat. Sucking on a fresh lemon. Just like cutting it open, sucking the juice straight out of it, or if you don't want to actually suck a slice of lemon, you squeeze mm. the fresh juice out and drink it. It's a, it's awful. It sucks, but it's extremely oh, good. I like that. And like helping you, <laughs> um, and helping your throat like heal. Yeah, it's acid. Strep throat. Yeah, it'll, it'll <laughs> it's acid. It'll, it'll eat the back, not the bacteria, but the infection off of it. It'll help clear the phlegm, if not the phlegm. What am I thinking? The pus, which is mm -hmm. gross if you think about it. But yes. That's why a lot of cold remedies include lemon juice, uh, tea, honey, and whiskey, because each one of those has a, um, a a medicinal property. I believe that's a um, the lemons thing. Right? That was actually an old uh, Stonewall Jackson thing. <laughs> general, uh, general, 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 the Confederate General Jackson from the Civil War. That was something he used to do a lot. Was suck on lemons because he believed they were good for his health, among a lot of other things. He was a he was an eccentric individual. By the way, seven seven Sentinel says powdered egg whites on the food you feed your cat helps you with your cat allergies. That is, there's actual science behind that. Yeah, I've never heard that before. I have never heard such a thing, and I'm gonna say. Doesn't matter. Cat allergies don't, don't exist. Yeah. I'll, 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 I, I'll, 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 i Killing machines. killing machines. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> per perfect killing machine in a in a five pound body. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's an aesthetic I aspire to. All right, juice. You haven't chimed in very many. Give me another one. Oh yeah, back to the main. Um, yeah, I was just thinking like, what is this? This is what is this? The cat <laughs> podcast? What are you talking? This is the motorcycle podcast. I'm trying to get us um, back, but this shit is so interesting. I don't want yeah. to, but let's do it anyway. <sighs> I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily have a product. Was I when I was thinking of other things that we could try to categorize as like hell yeah or had a layer down. I know this is kind of a buzzy one if you're in the in the know about the the comings and goings about new motorcycles. But how do we feel about the Buell Super Cruiser? Is that a big hell yeah? Is I that a have a layer down? I, I think it's a scam. Person. I don't believe it's ever going to really happen. It's, I think it will happen. Released. I thought there was a Did they release? Them releases there's a out. couple of them. Yes, they have not. No, there's the the like the pre-production, which it probably will change even from that. Uh, was at Daytona. That's yeah. That it is not going to be out until next year. Well, that's even even that one was even different than the one that they put out almost two years ago. It looks totally different. Yeah, that's true. Sydney. People Sydney. paid fifty dollars for the right to put down a down payment later. So the fifty dollars you paid isn't your down payment. That's just a right for them to call. It. That's just a reminder for them to call you when they are taking prepayments. Eh. I mean, it's definitely it, it's definitely a money grab toward people who like the Dynapro aesthetic of bikes. That's a lot of people, and I, and I will leave it at that. Uh, so Jerry he, says had a layer down. I think it's a hell yeah. I I just think it's a, it, it looks like a souped up FXR, and here's not. I like the look of it. I like the aesthetic. I like that. But I don't like that it's a souped up FXR and you can build it yourself out of an FXR frame because that's literally what it is with box parts for probably half the price. Now, it seems like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Yankee. Uh, no, it's just. I have. It's a very mixed bag for me. Um, I like. You know, obviously, we had the first. When, it, when we first all saw it, it was the thing essentially that Roland Sands built. 
which was a one-off like prototype. And everybody got really excited about that. But I remember looking at it going, I like what's going on here, but this bike is unfinished, but that makes sense. It's a prototype. But everybody just kind of forgot that that whole thing was built off of a custom one-off frame that Roland Sands designs. Like, that is not ever going to be a production machine, cool as it is. Um, I actually, yes, well, the ones that they rolled out at Daytona, and I, I still don't, Oh, I hear a lot of people go, yeah, oh, yeah, that's the production model, model, but then I think, like you said, it's really more of a pre-production thing. I don't know. I know they look different and are different in a lot of ways than that Roland Sands prototype. I'm actually, to tell you the truth, I'm actually somewhat surprised that even in this phase of production, they look as similar to that original bike as they do, knowing that that thing could never be made street legal. Um, I think the company behind this whole thing, the new Buell, is in my completely unsubstantiated biased opinion is very shady. They make a lot more noise than they do bikes. And that really concerns me. They, you know, I don't, I just, I don't have a great feeling about them, but all that being said, all that being said, I do think the existence of that bike pre-production prototype, whatever you want to call it, it has accomplished something and i don't know if the rest of the motorcycle industry will pick up on us but pick up on this but i sincerely hope they do it has proven an idea a concept sort of idea that you can have a cruiser that keeps the traditional cruiser looking lines looks like a cruiser looks like an american motorcycle but has all the sport bike underpinnings it has that you know that well, rear Right, it has that, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, like that rear swing arm, the gull wing thing that like a lot of sport bikes do. A lot of the frame on that is very sport bike bike. It shows that it can be done. If they actually, if the manufacturers actually give a crap, they can make a bike that still looks like a cruiser, looks like an FXR, but essentially has all those modern, those modern high performance components underneath. And I'm not saying every bike and every cruiser needs to be like that. But it can exist. It's, it so, is actually possible, and I feel like so that's a good thing. You like the you like that the concept of the super cruiser is a cruiser platform of a riding style bike that is putting out a like super sport race bike numbers between the speed torque, all of that. Well, also just the speed torque, but then like the general underpinnings of it. Now, again, I've, I've never ridden one, probably never will, let's be honest. But it looks like it can also, because of, like the mo it's got like a modern frame and all that. And so that would imply that maybe it can also handle really well. It just, that's, that's all I'm saying is that it proves that the idea is valid. You look at the Buell Super Cruiser, it looks like a cruiser. But underneath, you know, it's got a lot of those modern kind of design functions yeah. that most, you know, modern cruisers have shied away from because, oh, well, it won't achieve the look. Well, you can't achieve the look and have all that. If that's, if anything, that's, I think, what it proved. So I'm, I'm going to start the pod a little bit here. I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember when Arlen Ness got with Victory and started making the Victory motorcycle line, the cruiser yeah. line. I remember when, that. When they came out, that was the bike. He, and the design of that was, again, from his... You know, cruiser building days, you don't build the bike that you're not going to ride. You build the bike that's ready to get on the highway and you won't get a ticket for it. Granted, every once in a while they, they leave some things off, but it had brakes, it had lights, it had turn signals, it had a horn, it had everything it needed to be street legal. When they brought those victories to market, you know, when they had the unveiling, that was the bike. It was ready to go. So you take this super cruiser now, it's not ready to go on the highway. It's not street legal. They're, you know, you're not going to be able to get it, you know, registered. Because it's not ready. The one, the one that they showed. So yeah. car, car companies yeah. do this too. You go to a car show, they're like, "This is going to be the two twenty twenty seven, you know, Chevy Eldorado." And it looks like you, know, you can fly it to the moon and drive around through craters with it. And when it actually comes out, it's half the size, totally rounded. They did, they've taken all the cool stuff off of it because now they have headlights, tail lights. It's got to pass EPA inspections. It's got to have all this stuff. And it's an absolutely different motorcycle or a different car now. And they did the same thing with this motorcycle. They're never going to put that motorcycle on the street because they can't. It will never sail. Well, I mean, I would I would disagree because the pre-production models they had at Daytona, they did remove like the race exhaust and the race tires, but otherwise that bike would be street legal and ready to rock. I would be very like, surprised because here's what they got to think: somebody's going to finance that bike, and then you have to insure it. 
And if it's a bike that the insurance company knows that won't get insured, the finance company knows you're not going to be able to keep it insured, they're not going to finance that bike. It has to be completely street legal, not kind of partly. It's got to be street legal because they don't want to lose their investment on it. No, Unless they had to borrow. Guys, that, that was the whole thing about it. It's like they had to borrow parts from the other fuel bikes that are in existence to make it, well, one, cost effective to make the bike, but to make it EPA compliant. So they, I think they've already done that homework. It's just a matter of like, They've got a long list of production of like people saying they want to buy the bikes, but will they actually keep those numbers up? I think that's the bigger question mark rather than is the bike going to be street legal when it actually launches? I think they're well on their way to doing that. I bet you that'll be a $45,000 bike by the time they get it to actually to market. And people right. who, just like you say, people that have said they're going to buy it, they're going to be like, I thought it was a $30,000 bike, which I still think is pretty cheap for what that thing is. A bare bones cruiser looks good. Street legal, cool, but by the time they actually get it to market, it's going to be so much more money. Because again, the longer the longer, and here's something that I have seen: the longer it takes to get something to market, the higher that price tag gets. Because they keep putting more and more into it, and it's going to be so expensive by the time it, if it ever does get to market, people won't want it, or it's All going right. to be a niche uh, product. So for the Buell Super Cruiser, hell yeah, or had to layer down. Hell yeah. layer down. I'm going to lay it down. A, a sad layer down. I don't want to have to lay it down. I don't want to have to tie it to a post behind the woodshed and, you know, do the deed, but it seems like it might be necessary. If they could actually do what they said they're going to do, if it, if it went to market and they could give you what they're actually showing people, I'd say hell yeah. But I know better because I've seen it. I'd love to be wrong. I'll say that. I would absolutely love to be wrong, but... I will say with my limited knowledge of what the bike is, what they claim, how it looks, the price that they originally said it would be marketed as, it has bare bones. Yes, it'll be fast. Yes, it'll be nimble and responsive, but for 30 plus, for a bare bones naked cruiser, add a layer down. It's kind of the same, electric bike, Rob. What do you think about it? For the same price, you can get, a, you can almost for the same price, get a, a full ready to go touring platform bike from harley bmw kawasaki you know you can get a road glide a voyager an r18 for basically the same price to me it's a had to lay her down because it just doesn't make sense if, if they can stay in that 25 to twenty-seven thousand mark like they're talking that they're going to keep it at which is a like a three thousand dollar increase over when they launched the whatever that sign up list if they can keep it in that price point, that's their only way of survival with this bike. Now, to, to prevent us from just keeping talking circles about that, Seven Sentinel made a, a item recommendation for us to go over. Um, a, a throttle assist, a wrist saver, you know, one of those nubs or things you strap to the end of your throttle body so that you can rest your palm against it. For people who don't have cruise control or people who do have cruise control but just don't want to have to monkey grip their uh their throttle i'll say i had one on the rebel because i i didn't have cruise control so it was a lot of help up to about the six hour point of riding and then it just didn't matter that might have just been the version i had but i would say it's worth having do you three know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. I, I, have, I have one on yeah. the Harley. I have one on the I've Harley. I've seen them. It's good. It's like you say. It's good for about three or four hours, and after that, your hand gets so heavy you start you start applying more throttle without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. At the point where you normally kind of rest your wrists, you can't now. You have to totally recall clock it. And if you have one, you know what I'm talking about. The, the, the more tired your hand gets, you got to spin it back around and get it into a new position, and then try to reclock it. And that becomes tiresome. You go from doing that, you know, every like 30 minutes to doing it every 15 minutes to doing it every time your hand gets tired. Mm -hmm. um, do they help? Absolutely. But for a long-term solution, for like a tour, I don't know how, I, Beth had one going to, to um, Bro, what, two years ago? I don't know how she used it. And I think that's when she started just locking her throttle down. You're not supposed to use those things like that. It's supposed to be your, your, your take up slack for your throttle. You can actually put so much friction on that throttle that it'll lock it in place. And she started doing that. And I think that's when she did it was because it got so tiresome. And she's like, I'm just going to lock the throttle in place. 
Yeah, I'm just kind of indifferent to them. You know, like I, I get the idea of it, and you know, I think if you think that'll help, it's not necessarily a negative. But on a lot of my long trips, I can point to four or five different parts of my body that get fatigued way before my throttle hand does. That I, so for, it's just not. I just don't see it as a limiting factor. So now, is your bike fly by? Your fly, your bike's fly by wire though. It mine is yes. Yeah, so it's no not cable assist. Yeah. For for cable yeah. assist though, that cable that cable gets heavy after a while. Yeah, yeah, on, I can I can see that. But it but that thing definitely is not a replacement for cruise control. Cruise control no. is so yeah. much better. And you still can only use your right hand. You still have to have your right hand on the throttle all the time. Mm-hmm. You can't swap back and forth. I will I will say, I'll give it a hell yeah, because for it it has a place but it is not a replacement you know if you're going to be riding i would like i said for me if it was under six hours if i was taking like a two-hour ride somewhere perfect if i was riding for three hours somewhere okay if i'm doing a total of like two and a half hours one way two and a half hours back that's great it, it was nice but after about six hours it just it it became more of a not so much of like you said rainy like your hand would just get heavy and you'd start to get more throttle for me it would cause my wrist to twist in a weird way because it was only applying pressure to part of my hand on the yeah. outer side and it would cause a lot of cramping. And that's how it became um, an issue for me. Sydney, we already talked about sheepskin seat covers. Um, yeah, you missed it, Sid. Mm-hmm. Sleeping on Now, us. on the flip side of that, I never got one for the Rebel, but I did intend to. But our boy Jake one on his sporty and it's that atlas throttle lock so if nobody knows what that is it's a two-part piece it almost looks like part of a handcuff that you slide at the top and bottom around your throttle body and it goes in between the housing and the actual rotating part of your throttle and it uses friction to lock everything in place and it's a it's a flip switch to lock it and unlock it and it basically moves two parts to uh, push one part against your grip to lock it in place, and if you need to, you can twist your grip forward, and it'll slow you. You know, it'll release your throttle, or you can just flip the switch. That was and my question because it sounds scary to locking your throttle in place. It's locking your throttle in place, so it's not it's not cruise control. It is an RPM lock essentially. It is locking your bike in at a specific RPM. Yeah, I, I never had one. But I know that Amanda Zitto, as the magpie flies, I know that uh, her name is Caitlin. She is the um, female counterpart of the YouTube channel Scrambler Stories, who a few of us, I believe, met at our first FA back in March 22. She put one on her Rebel 500. Jake has one on his Sportster, and he seems to love it. And I would say... I think that's a great idea. I've seen a lot of positive reviews and likes of it, of of specifically the Atlas throttle lock. But I've also heard the downsides. If you're using it and then you start to go uphill, you very quickly start to lose speed because you're not, it's it's, it's not a cruise control. But it does give you the availability to take your hand off the throttle to stretch it and relax it if you need to. So I would say that might be better than a throttle assist or a wrist saver, but I don't know. I would I, I would say it's an in between between that and having cruise control. I think the throttle a throttle lock of some kind, besides just tightening that tensioner on the bottom of your throttle of your sporty, I think the throttle lock would be a good alternative. I'll be right back. Uh, Cindy says I'm not talking about the same thing. I'm gonna grab it off the bike. I'll be right back. That was but talk, in reference talk to the about Atlas Throttle Lock, I'm pretty sure. That, I mean, that we're like, that was a few minutes ago. Um, if we all just leave really quickly, how long do you think it would take him to notice? I don't know. I think he noticed pretty quick. Mm, yeah, he did see it on the screen, I think. I, I don't know. I'm just being silly. But, uh, so you two, opinions on an Atlas Throttle Lock, like Yankee, you don't have cruise control, so it might be something for you to look into. No, no, I, I don't even use cruise control in my truck. 
and I won't. I never have, and I never will. I did. Um, I considered an atlas, um, but at the time when I had the concourse, that is my road king has the cruise control now, but um, it was a cost thing. I just didn't want to pay for the atlas, and those cramp buster th- twist things are like ten bucks. So. Yeah, it worked nice. fine for for a bike that was eight hundred bucks new, like not new. Um, when I got it, yeah, no, I wasn't so the, spending one hundred and twenty five on Grant Busters yeah, was... like Rainy showed. Those are usually five to ten dollars, whereas an Atlas throttle lock is I think about one hundred and ten. Yeah, I saw I saw one that was probably a knockoff type, but it was like fifty bucks. And what I was worried about was, like you were saying, I was once you lock it in place, if I have to have an emergency and I have to stop or break, how do I get it off? So it's 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 a split. Like it's just a little thumb switch that is as simple as flicking up and down. You can also grab your throttle itself and just twist it forward. Yep. So I don't know about those of you with cruise control, but on my low rider, if I have the cruise control, if I pull in the clutch enough to engage it if I hit either the front or rear brake or if I grab the throttle and roll it forward like I was rolling off of the throttle Mm -hmm. those will all disengage cruise control as I understand the way that the Atlas throttle lock is supposed to work is kind of similar if you grab your throttle and roll it forward it's just like a friction pedal it's just held there yeah it's not like completely locked yeah it's not like it's crimping your your the rotating part of it down it's resting against the housing where you know you have all your switches and then when you flip it to lock it it's basically pushing an arm out with a rubber piece that rests against the rubber or metal part of your grip and it just presses against it to keep it locked in place it's it's held in it's held in place simply by friction it's not actually like locking anything down. So if you needed to, you could just grab your throttle and twist forward as you apply brakes in the clutch if you need to make it like an emergency slowdown. Yeah. 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 I would I would say for for, for limited use for me, Gma says she rode with her cram buster all the way across America. Uh, okay. But I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking if I'm going to take every trip now, I compare if I can use it on the 14 hour trip to Forgotten Angels. When we start talking about things, you know, if I was only riding three or four hours a day, sure, I probably would not even notice. But again, there's things you notice after six hours you don't notice after four hours. I, w- I would say, yeah, the wrist buster, the wrist saver, the cramp buster, the billions of names it goes by. I don't think it would be as beneficial for like riding from Ohio to FA because I had it on my Rebel for two of those trips I made down and I didn't have it when I rode in the uh, Nicole Sportster. And it only really made a difference for probably about two, maybe three of those. 16 plus hour group 17 plus hour trips yeah and, and before y'all judge me this was on the bike i do keep it on the harley so i do use it so i'm not i'm not saying you can't use it i'm saying for longer than four hours that that would they would get and again that's something i agree i am so spoiled using the cruise control that you know last time i used this on a long trip was going down to uh little sturgis at the end of august so that's probably the longest trip I take of this is going down to Little Sturgis, and it's about four hours. So, and it was fine for that. So, Bleak added in chat. He said the only time he's used his throttle lock is to temporarily lock the throttle so that he can shake his hands out and then go back to manually adjusting. So, yeah, the, the point of the Atlas throttle lock, I don't believe it is to just, to act like cruise control and just lock it there and leave it for hours. I think it's meant for like. I need to give my hand a break for a minute or two, lock the throttle where it's at, you know, stretch it, rotate it, do what you need to do, maybe stuff it down on top of the engine if you need to get your fingers some warmth back. But it's not meant for you to, like, lock it in place and ride for the next hour and a half down the interstate like that. I'm sure people have done that. I do not believe that was the intention of that invention. 
Now, they used to have, so my Sabre and the old, my uh, BMW RT had a throttle end lock. It was a bar end lock. Where you would twist the yeah. throttle down, then you'd pull with your pinky and it would lock it into place. It was, was kind of like on the bar, like now they put bar end stops on, on handlebars to extend them. That's where it was. You'd rock your throttle back and then push forward with your pinky and it would lock it in place. And if you had to come off the throttle, you're twisting it in the same direction that you're twisting the throttle off and it would pop it off. Shit, I know people used to use rubber bands. In the same spot you'd put an atlas, like, I don't think it's safe, but I know people would do that to ease up the tension if you were doing a longer road trip and mm -hmm. uh, didn't have one of these other things. But I've heard of that. I don't recommend that, but I, I know that's a thing people do. So. Here's, here's something people used to do, the gummy grips that people complain about that they get in the sun and they get gummy. If you have a glove that's tight enough, that gummy grip, you just lock it and it locks onto your glove and it won't slip off your glove and that's, that's throttle lock enough. You can open your hands up, you just got to keep your hands on the, on the throttle. You don't have to grip it. Yeah. It just hangs, it, it catches on your glove and pulls your glove. I mean, my issue with that would still be like, occasionally I, I want to take my hand off because I want to, you know, yeah. stretch it and flex it. Um, Let's do one more within of our two hours. This flies. Who's, who's got a good one? Sydney uh, threw out another suggestion if we want to use hers. Heated gear. Boo. Yes. <laughs> no. Uh, have the layer down. Not worth it. <laughs> um, again, so the only heated gear I use, again, so I, I've tried heated socks and I've tried heated gloves to very detrimental effect. Probably because I wasn't riding in weather cold enough to use them, but anytime I've rode with heated uh, socks, my feet sweat profusely and then I get even colder. And then the heated gloves always just burn my hand. They're just too hot, just, you know, because it's hard to control them. Uh, I did ride with a heated jacket and I freaking loved it and I still have it. And when it's really, really cold, I'll put the jacket on. And it's, it's a base layer jacket and it's heated and then I can put my riding jacket over it. And I loved it. And it was great. So for heated gear, I would ultimately altogether I have to say hell yeah. Heated grips, hell yeah. Heated, heated jackets, grips. hell yeah. Heated grips, absolutely. Heated seat, hell yes. Mm -hmm. Hell yes. Again, you don't know how cold your ass gets until you can have a heated seat, and then you're yeah. like, oh yes. It seems like Yankee and I might be the outliers here that haven't used heated gear. Um. Yeah, I just don't. I don't have a valid use case for it in my opinion um because at this point i feel like just with layering i can get the warmth that i need to in temperatures that go pretty much all the way down to outside of what you would encounter in the dead of winter which is when i don't want to ride anyway for reasons that just go beyond just temperature like i don't want i you know rainy i love you i don't want to deal with the ice i don't want to deal with the constant no. wet that that is i'm just i'm not i'm not going to be riding in january it's just not a thing i do I, so yeah for all the three other seasons i mean i don't get me wrong there are some occasions where i would like yeah having maybe a little bit of heat in the jacket or the gloves or whatever would be nice but it's just again it's never been a make or break thing to me so i just don't I just, yeah, I don't really, don't really have much use for it, so. So, yeah. I know I initially said I had to layer down to get a gear, but that's because I I have a pair of heated socks that run off a battery that Philzilla sent to FA for me last March, because as everyone here knows by this point, it was like 20 degrees for more than half of my ride to Tifton, Georgia. And I got frostbite on my toes. Um, but I also have a pair of like, what's the thing? Snowmobile battery, like heated gloves that also have like a battery pack in them. Those don't work. The moment you go faster than like 45 miles an hour with those gloves on and you have no way to deflect the wind from hitting your hand, they don't matter. Even if you have them on the hottest setting, they don't help. So I can't say that I've had much of a positive or a negative experience with those minor parts of heated gear. I've never had heated pants or a heated jacket, so I don't know. But I tend to run a little hot. I tend to be very warm usually when other people are comfortable or cold even. So I'm not so sure. I can't gear. Man. <laughs> Maybe. Or I'm just fat. 
So, <laughs> so I can't say if heated gear would be a good choice for me. I'm, I'm not sure. So I can't say hell yeah or how to lay down. I think it might be more of that practical category of like indifferent. Yeah. But, you know, being here in Ohio, I didn't ride at all like this winter in part because it might have been warmer winter than we usually have. It kind of remained in the mid to upper 30s to the mid 40s for pretty much most of winter. But because of that, we didn't have much snow. We got a lot more rain. When it would freeze, it would freeze in the ice and melt back in the water. But it was cloudy. It never had much sun. So that water stayed around. It didn't get absorbed. It didn't, you know, evaporate because of the sun. It didn't go away because it was so cold. It just sucked the moisture away. So we had, in my opinion, at least in my area, a wetter winter than normal, even though it was warmer and we had less snow. Yeah. So keep in I didn't get my chance to get out and ride. Yeah. And keep in mind, typically in these northern states, all that nice slushy water you see on the road. <laughs> It's mixed with salt. Salt. And what no. does salt do? Ruins it's just, everything. It's, it ruins everything. Those not. hopes and dreams. That's yeah. what it does. It you ruins know? your boots if you don't oil them. Just saying. I oiled my boots, by the way. Talk, everything. Talking, talking for a friend, Nara. Um, speaking of which, if you oil the boots, they are more windworthy. I'm just going to say, and, and rain. But yes, they'll actually keep more wind out if you oil the boots and the gloves. I'll say this, yes, Indy Ridge boots, especially the waterproof boots, uh, regardless of whether you treat them with oil or not, are great until it's below about 40. After you go below 40 degrees, I don't think it matters. It, it does. Below 40, I ain't mean, right. Well, time, well so. there, there's a point where I mean, you need to keep the wind out. You're keeping the cold out, that's great. So the, the way they stay waterproof isn't the leather, it's the liner inside them keep the wind from getting to the liner if you oil them. And this is with any boots, not just any ridge. If you oil them, you will put a wind layer on the outside of the boot, not on the inside of the boot. So the thermal barrier ends up being the skin of the boot, not the the um, rain jacket mm -hmm. inside it or the rain liner. One last thing that Nara was talking about, uh, hand guards. Hand guards 100% uh, on every bike that I have because one for gravel, two for wind, three for rain, um, and I'm sure you can keep coming up with big bugs, keep bugs from going up your freaking uh, sleeves. But uh, absolutely hand guards. Hell yeah, brother. They can be. I don't know that it's a hell yeah for me 100% of the time. But yeah, I think it looks cool. Yeah. Uh, just good, good pair of gloves. Doesn't, I mean, I, again, I could love to regret this statement, but good pair of gloves hasn't really let me down in that regard yet. So. Gloves are cool. We have run out of time. We, we, this actually ran really good. This episode went very fast because it was just like fired right through and I love it. Closing thoughts. Let's go with juice. Sometimes maybe hell yeah. Sometimes maybe had a layer down. Right. <laughs> that's, that's my thought. <laughs> All right. Nar. I know we kept you guys up really late today, so let's I'll, I'll, I'll run through. Nothing random. Um. <laughs> Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. Mad Yankee. All right, quick show of hands among the four of us. Uh, who here thinks they are not an idiot? Okay, so you'll notice that no hands went up. <laughs> so, okay, well. I had to think on it. but okay. The, the, point I'm, the point I'm really trying to make here is that, you know, regardless of what the four of us might say, whether we like a certain piece of gear and or accessory, or we think it's a great idea, or we think it's terrible and, you know, want to throw it in the fire, it doesn't, doesn't ultimately matter. If it's something that enhances your riding experience that you like, and at the end of the day, increases your fun, makes you, it lets you have more fun on the bike, well, then that's always just going to be a hell yeah. It might not be a hell yeah for us, but it's certainly a hell yeah to you. And don't listen to us. We're just we're just four idiots talking about what we like and dislike. And it's just different for anybody. At the end of the day, realistically, we do this for fun. We do this because it's a because it's a fun that makes us 
feel like life is not so crappy sometimes. If whatever that piece of gear is does it for you, then hell yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Great point. Yep. Sometimes it may be BMW, sometimes it may be Harley. Right. My tastes are going to change. Something I think is cool today, uh, I'll probably think is, you know, hyperbole tomorrow. And what I think is stupid today, tomorrow I might find a very good use for. So with that, each of us have a channel. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, each of us have a channel. Go to our Instagrams, go to our, go to our YouTubes. And, and I even, yeah, Yankee has a video on YouTube. I know he does. So you have a short. Used to make, but. Yeah. Maybe it's five years old, but yeah, when I look up your channel, there's one video. Hmm. It's like, I'll have to take a look at that. So, uh, so uh, Serenity Kitty, I'm still trying to get her in for an interview. So keep thinking about that. Get back to me. I think I've literally interviewed everybody on this page now, except for Journey of Jerry. So we're going to have to line something there up too. But you might, have to, you might have to make a special trip to Georgia to do that one in person. I could. I could. Or we could have a campfire one. Uh, I've actually, I have a very good interview I did at, at the camp out with somebody. And when I got home and started editing it, they they messaged me and said, please don't do the interview. There's things I said in there I don't want. After thinking about it, they said, I don't want that stuff spread out. So that was probably a good one that I, I'm glad I didn't do live. Because then after they thought about it, they were like, I don't want people to know that about me. And they changed their minds. You, you could create it set it completely as private other than the person you share the link with and send it to them and say, tell me what parts you want clipped out. He said, I don't want to do that. Okay. He, goes, I'll, I'll, he goes, and, and I'm going to respect that because here's what, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm no, you know, Charles Corralt or anything. If, you, know, you guys are old enough to remember that, but you know, I'm going to pretend you didn't just say that Charles Corralt. I that VHS of the American Revolution documentary is buried in this house somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he he was big about saying, okay, if if I'm not going to press anybody, he 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 did such great interviews because he interviewed people in their element, and if they didn't want to talk about something, that's that's the whole thing I think is missing in journalism today. If you make someone uncomfortable, they're never going to want to interview with you again, and they're going to regret interviewing, and they're going to tell all their friends not to interview with you. So. You know, that uh, person's comfort, Brady, 100%. Serenity said, interview them at the camp out. That's what I'm going to do then. Then I will see you there. <laughs> Sounds right. like plan. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to burn any bridges, you know, because again, it's, it's you know, one of my things the other night, they asked me what my favorite anybody ever did was, and it was Shelly's because she trusted me with that interview. So, and I wouldn't want to lose anybody's trust. So if he doesn't want to be interviewed, you know, if he doesn't want his interview to go forward, it's not going to happen. So, but anyway, we have wasted you guys time. I see you guys fighting the sleepy bear. So at this point, I'm just going to tell you guys to like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell. If you haven't hit the like button already, please do. Um, it helps out. Um, if you guys feel like donating to Forgotten Angels, it's www.forgottenangelsflorida.org. Donate directly to them and tell Cindy that we sent you. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and close for the night. I'm glad all you guys came out. Everybody who came to visit us, thank you very much, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Peace.